faster than a speeding bullet. I ran until my muscles burned and my veins pumped battery acid. More powerful than a locomotive. An idea is like a virus. Presumed. Highly contagious. Able to leap tall buildings with a single bound. All right, Jacques, I am super pumped to have you on the Better Humanology podcast, man. Welcome to the show. Thanks so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Yeah, we're going to we're gonna hop into some pretty interesting topics I think that our listeners um, are really going to enjoy. But before we do that, let's get started with a fitness challenge. Yeah, uh, uh, I, I love the Versa Climber, and it's becoming more and more popular. LeBron James is put a lot of Instagram posts and he's got the whole team using it and uh, Andy Murray uses it. Uh, It's an unbelievable piece of equipment for any type of athlete for a number of reasons. Number one, uh, there's no impact. Uh, Number two, it's metabolically extremely challenging for a number of reasons. Uh, One is your arms are above your heart. You're using both arms and legs simultaneously. And there's really nowhere to hide because the only way you can hide is if you stop moving and stand. Uh, If not, you have to carry your body weight. So it's really a power to weight uh, dictated movement. So the hardest thing I've done on it, and anyone can give it a try, and I'll give you some yardsticks on it. We have a group class here at our center that we use. But the traditional Tabata interval, 20 seconds on, 10 seconds off for four minutes. So you do a 20-second sprint, 10-second rest, standing on the climber, 20-second sprint, all out, 10-second rest. Uh, And then on the eighth effort, we do a full 30 seconds straight through that ends at four minutes. So it's a total of four minutes. The total amount of work time is only 2.83 of a minute. Uh, So it's not a little less than three minutes of total effort time. And in we have a club we call the 600 Club. If you can cover over 600 feet in that period of time, you're rolling pretty good because you have to keep over a 220 pace in the uh, efforts. And the uh, highest number we've seen is 961. Wow. Uh, uh, and that is actually, I did the 961. I'll take a credit for that. I was pretty proud of it. But literally, it was the hardest thing I have ever done fitness wise (laughs) and I've done a lot. It was so brutal because, you know, by number five, the first couple of them, you feel pretty good, but then you start getting into oxygen debt and they get really hard. So give it a go, 20 on, 10 off. You do seven at 20 seconds. The eighth effort is a 30 second effort, which takes you right through to four minutes. Anything over 600, you're pretty badass. If anyone can break a thousand, please let me know, and I'll give them a month of uh, training here on our. <laughs> I could learn something from it. That's awesome. Right. Yeah. That that sounds like quite a challenge. That would uh, definitely push just about anyone, no doubt. Especially with those numbers you threw out there. That going over a thousand, I'd like to see that too. Uh, yeah, nine sixty one. Uh, I there is a video of me doing it on Facebook, our Facebook page. If you want to see it, it was I was definitely you can see how hard and uh, how much I was hurting. Uh, so anyway, give it a go. All right, how about a mental toughness challenge? Yeah, uh, what I've learned because we do these interval classes on the Versa Climber and the way I structure them. Uh, because mentally, we have the Ten Commandments. We call the workouts FUBAR workouts. Uh, it's an acronym that comes from the military. It means effed up beyond all recognition. So at the end of one of these 30-minute uh, group classes, you're pretty beat up. But uh, typically, I write the workouts uh, so that they get shorter over time. So maybe someone will start with a minute effort, and then they'll go to 45 seconds. and then we'll, So we're getting shorter because mentally, that's easier. Everybody, the fourth commandment on our board of the Ten Commandments of FUBAR says that it's always in anticipation of the next effort that drives people to quit. And so it's always the no one quits during the effort. It's the anticipation. So if you want a mental toughness uh, challenge, and I do this with tennis players, I do this with wrestlers, I do just the opposite. I lengthen the time of the interval as we get longer. So it becomes more difficult. So I may start with a 15 second effort uh, on the first one and then go to a 20 second effort. Uh, There's still sprints 
So they become mentally challenging because you run up against the idea of having to go longer after you just killed yourself in the short run. So the improvement in mental toughness is phenomenal. So if you ever want a mental toughness, uh, something that really improves it, increase the intensity as you get further down the road and lengthen the time that you have to hold that intensity as opposed to the opposite. And that's a great challenge. You can apply it to anything. So you can apply it to burpees, you can apply it to push-ups, you can apply it to anything because it challenges you to say, I got to get down and do more now. That's mm-hmm. where, uh, that's when people crack. Uh, it's always, you know, I got one more climb on the bike. That's when you cry. And, you know, in bike racing, you know, uh, it's a, you know, kind of something that people will do. They'll start talking to somebody, you know, in the middle of a climb. They'll go, hey, how you doing? Gosh, I know this is a tough climb. And you're dying. And you're going, this guy's talking. (laughs) (laughs) And he's trying to crack you. Uh, And so to become mentally tough, I think that setting up your training, uh, especially metabolic uh, training, so that the efforts are longer, it really tests your mental toughness. And you can condition it because you can talk yourself through it. I have a mantra I use uh, in my head. I go, looking good, feeling strong, nothing can go wrong. And then I time that to whatever the effort is. And I just keep telling myself, I'm going to get relief, I'm going to get relief, I'm going to get relief. And that's how uh, I, I try to instill that into a lot of the athletes I train. I really like that. And especially anytime I hear someone else talking about blending kind of the mental aspect with the training, not just by making it hard, but really playing into the nuances of uh, the human psyche there. I think that's a really awesome mental toughness challenge. Yeah, because I had a, a really good tennis player that went up to college to play last year. And he would really bright kid, but he would think his way out of stuff. I mean, he would be up on somebody and he couldn't close. So every time we were doing intervals, I was going, okay, this is it. Put yourself into that point where right where you're up on points and you got to close here. And we would drive so hard, you know, on those intervals because then when you recreate that environment, that's what practice and training and that's what a strength coach can really do for an athlete is you want to simulate and you want to risk in the a con- a controlled environment. That's when you want to take the risk. But a lot of people won't take the risk at that point in time and then when they get into the game and they have to then they're in no man's land they're going god this doesn't feel good anymore and then they crack got it so that's what you want yeah how about a book recommendation yeah this one's a little different uh because it applies more to uh there i actually have two if you want to but uh i'll give you the first one the uh the first one uh is applies more to someone who's running a business in this business or wants a great book on selling uh i've read a lot of books over the years and i've listened to a lot of sales presentations etc and uh the uh it was written in the 40s by a guy named frank becker b-e-t-t-g-e-r And it's titled, How I Raised Myself from Failure to Success in Selling. And it kind of applies to what we're talking about here because he was a professional baseball player. And back then when pro ball players, you know, in the minor leagues didn't make it to the big leagues or whatever, they sold insurance. You know, they went to sell life insurance door to door. So it was written in the 40s. It's been used and translated into hundreds of different languages A lot of insurance companies will use it. And he would tour around with uh, Dale Carnegie back in the day. And so it's a 45-minute read. Uh, He talks about selling. And, uh, you know, know, I'll give you a quick anecdotal story in there. Uh, He said when he first tried out for the team and he got picked up by a small club in St. Louis or somewhere, he was so nervous because he didn't think he belonged. You know, he didn't think he was good enough. And so... He would be in the outfield and he would be, you know, casually running stuff down because he didn't want to look like he didn't know what he was talking about. So he always tried to play it really cool. And finally, the coach brings him in and says, I'm trading you because you have no enthusiasm for the game and you suck. And he goes, <laughs> in, in his mind, in his mind, he was going, I, I could have gone harder, but I didn't. So then he picked, he went to the next team and he goes, I'm going to chase everything down like it's my life's dependent on it. And 
all of a sudden he says he tripled his income. He was no better a player. He said he just tripled his income because they paid him more and they called him Pep Vector because he was so peppy. And what he said is sales, a lot of it is driven by enthusiasm. You got to love this business. You got to love what it is that you do and you have to be enthusiastic. So it is the best sales book and there's a lot more in it, uh, but it's really written. It's past the test of time and uh, and it's very it's a 45 minute read and it goes into some basic things about selling. So uh, I thought it's a good book that I recommend it to people who are kind of new uh, in the industry or new and uh, or even if you're not, I reread it from time to time. The other one that applies more to life lessons is Meditations by Marcus Aurelius. If you remember the uh, movie Gladiator, he was the old king that was uh, in there with Russell Crowe that died and then Comodos, his son, took over and was a psychopath. Uh, but he ran Rome for 20 years and it's a series of statements from his journals on you know, what he looks at and, and life and, and how he sees, you know, uh, life and how he deals with life. And the basic premise, you know, is you have past is gone and the future is not guaranteed. So you just have this moment is what a lot of it's driven by. So it's a, a wonderful book that you can read a thousand times. So I like books like that. So it's a good one. Yeah, it's a really good book. That's a awesome recommendation there. All right. All right, how about uh, giving everyone listening a little bit of a, a background uh, in of you and your business over the last you know years, or you know take it all the way yeah. all the way back if you yeah, need yeah. to. That'd be great. Yeah, uh, I uh, became a CSCS almost seventeen years ago now. Uh, when I was telling someone we did it at UCLA, and there was blue books and videos, and it was actually a six-hour exam. <laughs> three hours in the morning, three hours in the afternoon. But I, I started as a wrestler in high school and college. I went to UC Davis and wrestled there. And so wrestling was my sport. It's a power to weight sport. You start looking at nutrition, uh, you know, back when I was 13 years old, you know, 14 years old, because you're trying to make weight. Uh, so that was my foundation. I think it gives me a lot of uh, understanding of biomechanics, which is very helpful today when I'm coaching athletes. Uh, and then I became a cyclist later in life and started because I had a lot of knee issues when I was wrestling. So I started racing bikes and then got into the business of uh, strength and conditioning back about uh, 17 years ago when a friend of mine said, Jacques, you know, you should really check out our center. He was a doctor and they had a bunch of isokinetic equipment in there. And he goes, come in and try it. So I tried it as a cyclist and uh, I liked it. And then he kind of came over to me and I was more of a business guy at the time, and he says, uh, hey, listen, would you be interested in getting involved because we don't like the guy that's running it, and maybe you could help us. And so that was my toe into the business of training. That's when I took the strength coach exam, and that was the start of my journey. Uh, I turned the center around. Uh, I wanted to buy it. They didn't want to sell it. I had a no compete for 50 miles, so I opened a center in Santa Barbara called Titan Sports Performance. It's still there 17 years later. I sold a majority interest in it to two of my coaches, so I don't have to go up to Santa Barbara, but I talk to them, and they're doing a great job. So if you're ever in Santa Barbara, it's a great training center. And we trained a lot of athletes from volleyball players to basketball players. We were really early on probably one of the first strength and conditioning centers in Santa Barbara at the time. And at the time, this is how long ago it was, you see Santa Barbara didn't even have a dedicated strength and conditioning training room for the athletes or an in-house strength coach. Now they do, and it's changed a lot. But we trained the volleyball team from there, the women's basketball team when they made it to the uh, final eight uh, one year. So that was my start. And then I decided I wanted to expand and jump full-time into uh, you know, uh, strength and conditioning. So I opened a 7,000 square foot center here in San, in Los Angeles called Sirens and Titans Fitness. And uh, we specialize, we train all kinds of athletes from, you know, uh, runners to basketball to football, all the major sports. But I have a focus on power to weight and, and uh, because of being a cyclist and really thinking about power a lot and power to weight. It applies to wrestling. It applies to a lot of other sports, uh, running, uh, all kinds of sports. So 
uh, that kind of brings you up to speed. Uh, now, and I wrote a book uh, about strength and power training for cyclists that came out last June called Maximum Overload for Cyclists that Rodeo Press published. So that kind of gives you the overview. Awesome. And, you know, we talked a little bit before the show, um, your emphasis on power and how much you studied and researched and applied it uh, in your practice. So what what led you to putting, you know, so much time and energy into, and you talked, you, you, when we were talking before, you're talking about uh, all athletes, you know, you could have uh, someone who's older to, uh, you know, a power athlete. Why have you found power to be so important in someone's training? Uh, because I think that we kind of uh, have a tendency, we have a hyper focus on strength uh, in this business because it's really easy to measure. And I say that all roads lead to power at some point in time. And then it's power times an X factor. Are you a high jumper? Okay, then your X factor is maybe six jumps in a meet, eight jumps in a meet. You know, yeah. are you a cyclist where you have thousands of revolutions, you know, uh, over a five hour ride that you're doing, uh, but you have to produce an average power. So there's different levels of power because all human movement is based on power. Now, there's other components that come into it. Uh, and I'm working with a world class uh, rower right now. And I was evaluating her and her trunk stability is relatively weak. And I said, you're scrubbing power up because everyone thinks of core is just the ability to hold yourself upright. It's really in a with a rower, it's the handles to the feet. If she and the best example is if she had a hand injury and couldn't grip the handle too far, her output would drop dramatically. Well, if you have a weak trunk stability, the same thing happens, but you just don't feel it. It just you just see it and as a result of lower power output. So when I'm looking at sport and I'm evaluating an athlete, I'm saying what's the movement I need and what's the optimum amount of power necessary, and then what are the components of that? Now, when you look at power and you say you look at the equation, you say it's force times distance divided by time equals power, and strength is your ability to generate a force. So force is a component of it. But when you start looking at the mathematics and you start looking at the distance divided by time, which is velocity, and then that whole strength uh, velocity curve comes in, uh, our force velocity curve comes in for power. You know, that a lot of we're seeing a lot more velocity type training uh, that's being used. Uh, then you start saying, OK, where in that equation do I have gaps? Uh, is it in force production? Is it in mobility so that where our force production is limited because mobility is an issue? So if you start from power and work your way backwards, it's much easier then to evaluate the athlete for me to determine what I need to do. Now, where things have a tendency to break down is power is tough to measure. If you're looking at uh, power clean, a really good strength coach will tell an athlete, you know, where their optimum power output is. And then the, uh, by look, looking at the speed of the bar, but now we're having the ability to measure the speed of the bar, the accelerometers on the bar, or on the wrist of the athlete, uh, which is going to give us a lot more data and make it a lot easier for people to measure. But that's what I'm looking for. And then the next uh, part of the equation, uh, when we talked earlier, I said that if your sport lasts longer than 10 seconds, so I'll give you an example. If I was to ask a basketball player, and I have a new uh, basketball player that's trying to, to go into the summer leagues this year that just signed up, and I said, let me ask you a question. I go, if you could jump as high in the fourth quarter as you do in the first, how much of a better player would you be? He goes, huge. So, but we in this industry have a tendency to focus on just absolute, okay, let me improve your vertical jump. What I want to do for him is I want to say, I want to improve your percentage, the highest percentage of your maximum vertical jump longer so that you can answer that question so that when the game is on the line, you're going to pull down the rebound because you're getting 90% of your max output in that fourth quarter and you just didn't fall apart. So that's how I see my job as a strength coach 
and not just for the athlete, but also for the individual, because when you think about getting out of a car, getting off the floor, you have to overcome gravity and, and uh, to a certain degree. And in some cases, if you are skiing or any type of movement where you have to catch yourself or move, power has to be produced, whether you're 85 years old or whether you're 18 years old. So that's why I spend so much time figuring out more effective ways to bring power to my athletes and my clients. Yeah, and I find that really fascinating because that's something, uh, to be honest, I've looked a lot at in uh, training athletes and programming is this, along the lines of what you're saying, this slow movement strength protocols uh, where you're just going to linear progression where you're just putting more weight on the bar every single week and yeah, the only measure is there's more weight on the bar, but they're never really wor- worried about the speed of the bar or really producing any any amount of force uh, beyond just lifting more weight. Uh, how, what are some of the ways that you start to implement more power work with uh, a more general athlete? Yeah, the first thing I do is you have to identify every athlete's different because you're going to be different based on percentage of fast twitch fiber versus slow twitch. When I get a cyclist, the majority of them, unless they're track cyclists or sprinters, uh, you know, have a 11 inch vertical jump. <laughs> you know, they can't jump very high because they're all, you know, uh, slow twitch fiber types of athletes. So the first thing I do is I identify at what speed does the athlete produce optimum power. Now, what I have a number of tools here. I have a K box here with a K meter on it. Uh, so I can see in a squat at what speed they're producing the most amount of power. Uh, typically, when you look at the research, it's going to be 30 percent, 20. I would say between 20 and 35 percent of your one rep max is where you're going to produce the highest amount of power output. I also have a Versa pulley, which has a, a readout on it. And it's a, if you're not familiar with the Versa pulley and, and the K-Box, they're both iso-inertial training mechanisms. So it allows me to get a really explosive concentric output and an eccentric load, and I can measure the output. So, and for example, uh, I can use a really simple uh, metaphor that will kind of clear up what I'm trying to do. Uh, In cycling, if you're riding with a bunch of guys going up a hill and you're the weakest rider and you're at the back and you're going, how am I going to hold on to these guys? What you'll start doing is trying to change the gear. So the first thing you'll do is you'll say, well, I'm going to get a smaller gear and I'm going to spin faster. What you're doing in that equation is you're trying to get more velocity. You're trying to find optimum power output to keep up with someone by increasing velocity. You're going, oh, crap, I'm falling off. That's not working. Let me try a bigger gear. And then you stand out of the saddle and you start, you know, pushing the bigger gear. Now you've increased force. So what I do And then eventually, maybe you'll find the right gear where you can still hold the pace and stay up with the guys and keep the pedals moving over and uh, and it's tolerable. So when I have an athlete in here, I'm trying to zoom in on that optimum gear, like with the cyclist looking for it going up the hill. And once I find that, then first of all, I'm trying to improve it. And then I'm trying to look at their sport and say, what percentage of that? do I have to have in terms of efficiency of producing power? And that's what it really comes down to, that when I talked earlier in the example about jumping higher, uh, jumping a higher percentage at the end of the game than at the beginning of the game, it's efficiently producing power. So if you jump 40 inches in a vertical jump, and that's 100% of your power, and then at the end of the game, you're jumping 30 inches uh, at the end of the game because you're so fatigued, then you're, uh, you've lost that difference, which is about a 25% drop off in power. And if I was to say, okay, so on the average in the fourth quarter, if you're jumping 25% less, how could I improve that to 27% to 28? So that in the first, in the way it works is you're more efficiently producing power. He won't jump higher than 40 inches. But at the beginning of the game, he's putting out less effort to jump the higher jumps. You see what I'm saying? I do. And yeah, so that's what you're doing is you're getting more efficient at producing power by training the athlete in a method that allows him to efficiently produce power. He won't jump. There's a genetic limit. Okay, so he's not gonna. I'm not gonna get 
add, I'm not going to add any more if he's already got a 43 inch vertical jump. How much more can I add? You know, but what I can add is his ability to hold the highest percentage of that longer. And I'd be curious just to know how you treat athletes differently, say one who's trying to emphasize pure power in that under 10 second time frame that you're right. talking about versus, uh, you know, more power endurance, someone who has to put out uh, a lot of power over time. Um, how, right. how do their, how does their training differ? Well, number one, uh, body weight impacts a lot when you're looking at absolute power. Uh, if you, uh, I'm going to use cycling again. And you look at there's a there's a really cool YouTube video of this German cyclist they call him the Hulk I think his quads have got to be close to 40 inches uh, in size and uh, they have him toasting a piece of toast. I've seen that video. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's awesome. Uh, that is absolute power example because and you look at the size of the guy he looks like a bodybuilder uh, because then body weight doesn't matter. All he's trying to do is he has to have the upper body, body uh, size to be able to – and you watch him pulling. The handlebars are flexing. He's pulling so hard uh, on there. And they build special you know, stems for these guys because they'll rip the bars off. They're, so, they're putting out so many watts of power you know, uh, in a sprint where they may put out you know, 1,800, 2,000 watts in a 100-meter sprint. It's insane. So weight is an, is an issue when you're talking about absolute power. Now, it is depending on what the sport is. High jumpers are going to have an optimum weight, you know, uh, but uh, shot putters, absolute power. So they're bigger guys. They're throwing an object that's much smaller than their body weight. So their body weight is going to be much larger. Uh, a world class cyclist. This is why the Tour de France is so hard to win. Because when they're time trialing, it's absolute power for the longest. When they're going uphill, it's power to weight. And so they have to have all of these uh, bases covered. And, and then they have to be able to stay up and then from time to time sprint and have a decent enough ability to hold the speed when it needs to get when the speed ramps up. So when you're training for sustainable power or efficiency in power, then body weight becomes an issue. Uh, and you'll see it. Uh, the best example is a marathoner versus a sprinter in terms of body type. Marathoner has to have the highest average output over 26 miles, and a 100-meter sprinter uh, size is not as big of an issue. That's why they're much bigger, because they're having to produce huge amounts of power over a short period of time. So a lot of it's dictated by hypertrophy, because you have to have a bigger force production side of the equation when you're looking at absolute power. Okay, that makes sense. And, you know, yeah. one one thing that you really put in context for me right at kind of the beginning when we were talking about power, uh, I guess I hadn't viewed it in this context before was, you know, part of the power equation is that distance and distance can be or distance can be limited by range of motion, lack of range of motion, lack of mobility, um, which is a really, really interesting point. Uh, because if you can't move a certain amount of distance because you're not mobilized to be able to do that, you can't provide enough power in that range of motion. Uh, so I, I, I find that really fascinating. Um, so true. You know, I call it tipping point fitness. That's what I call that. Uh, so if you can identify the range of motion, and if you look at it kind of compared to Formula One where these guys are have uh, you know all that technology to try to figure out if I move this wing slightly, we get a little more efficiency in power. Because they get better gas mileage. They don't have to pit as often. All these kinds of things. They're looking at every little tweak. And as a strength coach, I look at every little thing. So I go, if I can improve force production by 10% by getting more mobility in their hips or their T-spine or, or, or improving shoulder uh, uh, integrity, these kinds of things – then I can get bigger weight on a hex bar deadlift and I can get that increase in the force production. It changes the whole game. But other people are just saying, well, let's just put more weight on the bar, but I can't get any more weight on the bar because I can't squat low enough. So instead of adding, spending all that time on the weight on the bar, you know, you spend time on mobility. And then all of a sudden you get this big leap of improvement. And I call that tipping point fitness. And I did it with a player uh, that was a football player uh, a guy named Reagan Upshaw that played for the Raiders years ago. 
he was my first really big pro player that I ever trained. And uh, so I really started, he was a defensive end. I started ripping apart and I said, well, my job, if I was the ultimate strength coach, when the ball is snapped, he could jump over the O-line and land on the quarterback. (laughs) (laughs) It's, It's physically impossible, but that's my job. How can I get him there faster? And so I started by evaluating his stance and looking at everything. And we started timing his time off the ball. And he had this really wide, long stance because it was comfortable. I said, what if we shorten the stance up? Well, the problem was he couldn't sit. The short stance cut a tenth of a second off of his speed to the ball, off the ball. But his hip flexor mobility wasn't good enough to allow him to get into that shorter stance. So we spent a ton of time increase, increasing his hip flexor mobility, and we cut a t- and I watch him in the Super Bowl, and there he is lining up on the ball, and he slides that back foot up, and I go, "Holy crap, that's me on the field!" <laughs> it was so <laughs> exciting. It was really exciting, but we did it just through hip mobility. That's really and impressive, it, and it changed his game. You know, uh, but that's where that's why. You know, this a lot of people don't think about. This is a thinking man's game or woman's game. You really have to look at it and with fresh eyes say, how do I accomplish the ultimate goal of this particular, you know, sport and whatever that may be. And then marry that to the strengths or weaknesses of your athlete or your client. Yeah. And I think it's getting a little bit better these days. Um, athletes starting to focus more on mobility probably than they did in the past. But I still think that there's a big, uh, uh, you know, almost mindset or dogma that, you know, uh, if you want to be a strong, powerful athlete, I'm not going to focus on like these range of motion drill drills or, uh, you know, doing yoga or whatever, because it just doesn't seem applicable in your sport, you know, but having maybe having to explain it to them this way uh, gets more buy in from your athletes. Have you had any pushback from any athletes when you want to work on stuff like this? Uh, I'm pretty clear cut that uh, with the athlete, because if you have a high level athlete, if you're lucky, you're going to get six weeks of time with them, you know, so you have to look at a risk return. And what I do is I explain it to them. Uh, and, and I, and I explain to them that we have to spend this time here because the return is so great. Uh, so, uh, I'm very, very, uh, I, I spend a lot of time discussing the program design with the athlete as opposed to not, because, uh, if there's someone who's been in the sport for a long time, then they're going to give me good, valuable feedback because I really believe the true value of a great coach is selling the athlete time. That's really what it is because there is a clock that's constantly ticking and you want to get your athlete as fit as they possibly can as early in their career as you possibly can because the amortization of their ability starts to diminish as they get older and then you don't have any more time you see what i'm saying and every strength coach will say if i just had more time with my athlete i could have done x well when you start doing the math on how many off seasons a professional or world-class athlete has and what's the total amount of time. If I waste or someone wastes a week or so, it is a huge impact on the total time that you have. Yeah. That's, that's part of the game, right? Is, uh, you, you have to, you have to play the game in the amount of time that you have. And that's what sets, you know, different coaches and, and athletes apart is how much work can they actually get done in the time frame that they're allowed, allotted or given. Yeah. And there's a lot of, as everyone complains about, you know, uh, there's so much noise in the business and, uh, and, you know, there's, because there's so many, uh, avenues to post uh, information. And, uh, you know, I think that a lot of oftentimes the why it's easy to post a funky exercise on Instagram or something that's interesting, but it's harder to, 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 uh, explain why. Why? What's the reason behind it? What's the science behind it? What have I seen anecdotally? What have I seen practically? What have I, I experiment on myself constantly. If I'm bringing a new exercise in, I'll just completely bury myself in it. And then I see the next day how sore I am and where, so I can get a better idea 
on where I'm loading and what's the recovery time for this and how much can I program in in terms of density or total volume or total uh, intensity on a particular exercise. So it, it, it is something that there's a, there is a marriage of science and practical application that has to take place. And that's why I love, you know, you know, guys who are pure weightlifters, you know, and that maybe came from a practical standpoint uh, uh, and not so much from a science driven standpoint, because there's a lot of things that work well science wise and you should understand that, but it may not be practical uh, to do in a particular workout. Cause I see some of the setups on Instagram and I go, I could never do that and run a commercial business because I'd spent 45 minutes setting up the exercise, you know, right. <laughs> you, you look, well, we got this tied to the roof, put over top. It's, it's crazy to me, you know? I just couldn't do it. So you have to then weigh it in. If you only have one client, then maybe you can. And you've definitely done a lot of research and then also trained a lot of athletes. Now, where do you kind of uh, find a good relationship or balance between, uh, you know, research and, you know, staying up to date on things versus just relying on your own experience, you know, having trained so many athletes? Now, uh, where do you kind of draw that line or, or kind of have a good relationship there? Yeah, I, I wrote a blog uh, a few years back that said if everything we knew about uh, exercise science and nutrition was wrong, how would you train your athletes? Because 30 years ago, 40 years ago, we were really wrong, you know? And so uh, I think that you have to question that. My father always said, you know, uh, you know, think for yourself and question everything. And I think that you need to do that. And I think that, you know, there are some basic tenets of uh, exercise that have passed the test of time and are true. And, uh, and I think that you, then you have to marry those to the science that's, uh, that's the new science that is available and coming out. And the most unbelievable thing for a strength coach today is having the ability to go online and dig down the rabbit hole and buy PubMed information and read abstracts and, and research on this and not have to go to a library. You know, it's just, it can, you become so much more, but then you have to then say, okay, now how do I take this and apply it to an athlete? And is it practical? Can I really utilize this, you know, uh, to, to do the things that you're talking about? Because I was reading some uh, information on, Good mornings just recently, and I don't like them uh, personally because I think that there are, uh, there are so many other exercises that I can do, even though the research may say, well, it's very good for, you know, strengthening lower back. I just, I look at things from risk return as well. I saw an article that Eric Creasy wrote, you know, and he's big on shoulders and, and he limits a lot of his overhead stuff with his baseball players. And it's not to say that he doesn't like overhead lifts. You know, he got a lot of grief for it. But what I saw was he just says he's a smart guy that said sometimes the risk return isn't worth it when right. you can do something else. And so I think you have to marry all those. You have to say what's the risk return? What's the cost of time? What's the prevailing science? Is it strong enough to make a decision? And then what do I know anecdotally? And what have I seen that's practical with my athletes and what I've done today? And then not only that, you have to individualize it because there's a lot of things that look great when you're showing a, a video of an athlete who biometrically is perfect for this particular lift. But then you get an athlete who's, you know, six, nine femurs are monster long. And you can't do that same exercise anymore. So that's what's so wonderful about this business is, you know, thinking through that and coming up with a solution because it's a constant puzzle. So I think that you have to find the right pieces and then sometimes weigh them in terms of your skill set and ability to do it and understand it. What's the science and how relevant is it? And then the practicality of it. And do you have an alternative that may be, you know, because so if you say that the new science is 100% where you should be, but you have an alternative exercise that gives you 90% of it, 
and you feel lowers the risk and you're better coach at, at, at cueing it and it fits into the workouts better, then I would go with the 90 percent. Got it. And you see what I'm saying? So there's so many uh, moving parts to it that there's no right answer. Yeah, and that's you always have to take into everything into account a little bit. I mean, I know I have this conversation with athletes all the time about uh, the the snatch. You know, the full snatch is they sure. they might they kind of want to do it just because I don't. They saw some other guys doing it. They think it's cool, and right. I I really have to explain to them, you know, well, why are we snatching? Like, what are you trying to do? And there's probably ten other ways to get to that goal without you having to risk you know, your poor mobility overhead in that snatch position and getting injured, we could still get you to the same place with just bypassing it all together. You know, uh, and I have to explain that to athletes uh, pretty frequently, not to say that they'll, they'll never snatch. It's just we might have to do it in, in a more progress, progressed way than, than a lot of athletes uh, would enjoy. And the other thing is a strength coach, you have to recognize that there's a human being on the other side. Not, not, a, it's not a science, uh, it's right. not the, and it's not the Clint, one of the, uh, uh, people in the study. And, uh, for example, I'll have a high schooler and I know the guy wants bigger arms cause he wants to look good on the field. Right. I'm going to, I'm going to do some isolated bicep work. Exactly. Oh, well. It's not perfect for from a science standpoint, but he goes out of the gym with arms blowing out of his T-shirt. It feels like <laughs> a million bucks, and we have a big victory, and I love it. Uh, you know, it's like when I was uh, in high school, and you know, we would go. One guy had a squat rack in his garage. Another guy had some great set of dumbbells. We go to and we go garage to garage lifting. That's how we did it because there were no real commercial gyms, and the high school gym sucked. And on the weekends, it was closed, so we had no access to it. So, uh, and we would sit there and just, you know, bench till we couldn't bench anymore, <laughs> and, you know, and huge amounts of arms. And we'd sit there, you know, because we were friggin' 18 year old kids that wanted to get big arms. And so, but you'd be surprised how many pro players want to look like fitness models. Right. It's really <laughs> kind of crazy. These guys go, I want better abs, Jack. I go, you don't even see them. No, but I want to take my shirt off. I want to look good. You know? <laughs> so there is a there is a certain amount as a strength coach that you want to just give those victories. And 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 sometimes you want to think about that. And I'll throw that in for the last five, six, ten minutes of it. It's not the end of the world. So it may not be perfect from a science perspective, but it's perfect from a human perspective. Yeah, I think uh, I'm in complete agreement there. You're always factoring in that human element where. Hey, yeah, like we, you, you got to throw some bicep curls in the program from time to time just to make sure, you know, that 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 goal is being met. Even if you know there's a better way to do everything, you know, still making sure that you're uh, making your athlete happy is, is the bottom line. Exactly. And and, and not only that, there, there there is a certain mental value to that. Uh, when athletes look fit, they feel strong mentally. So you're, you're not just adding, you know, a vanity component. There is a certain amount of... Like a confidence piece. Yeah, it's the peacocking aspect of it. It's, the, it's why animals in the wild, you know, their uh, fur goes up on their neck because they want to make themselves look bigger. And the peacocks, you know, spread their colors out because, you know, that's what you do. Uh, and so there's a certain amount of that primal aspect of, you know, physicality that does make an athlete feel mentally strong. So you talked about that before and that adds to that mental toughness. Awesome. Well, this has been a great conversation, but, uh, let's get to the quick fire questions of the show. Are you ready? Sure. What's the hardest workout you've ever done? I'd have to say that uh, 961 on the 20 by 10 four minute versicline. That's probably the hardest, uh, most painful uh, workout. The hardest. I've done some hard things on a bike that have been, you know, two day, three day stage races that were, you know, physically probably the hardest thing I did. This uh, race called the Everest Challenge. Uh, it was a two day stage race. And uh, that's when at the end I had this sense of accomplishment that I hadn't had in a long time. And wrestling, you know, uh, was right up there. But in terms of a workout, uh, all out on that 2010 is probably the most recent one I've had. In your opinion, what's the best activity for building mental toughness? What I said earlier is, uh, 
you know, harm uh, metabolic exercises that uh, uh, you continue to increase the level of challenge with each one. And then you actually visualize yourself in whatever environment you want to be. Is it a tennis match? Is it a wrestling match? Are we boxing? Are we in an octagon? What is it? Are we at the end of, you know, the last two minutes of a basketball game? And you simulate that uh, in your mind as you're doing those uh, efforts. And if you could only have one piece of equipment to train with for the rest of your life, what would it be? Uh for me, that, I, 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 you, I, you gave me this and prepped me, but I would have, uh, you know, it's kind of like the desert island. What music would you pick? Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I would go with a probably an Olympic bar and weights, uh, but I, in terms of versatility, because I'm such a power guy, I'd have to go with the VersaPulley, an ISO inertial piece of equipment. Because you can get the flywheel heavy enough that you, I could still do strength on it, but I can do the power too in any range of motion. The uh, uh, so you can do power in a lateral range of motion. You can do chops. You can do everything. So because you can adjust the uh, vectors to almost any coming out of ground, coming overhead. So it's so versatile in terms of athletic movement and because I have such a focus on power uh, and I can do both strength and power in almost any range of motion on that piece of equipment. So the versatility is great and it also gives me a measurement. Uh, I like the K-Box too, but the K-Box is uh, is limited in terms of overhead and other stuff. It's basically just from the floor. So I, I would probably pick the VersaPulley. Awesome. All right. Uh, what is the best advice you have for becoming a better human? This is 100% open-ended. All right. Uh, let's see. I would say the best advice is realizing that you are 100% responsible for everything in your life. And uh, I, I'm a kind of a fate destiny guy. I think, you know, fate happens, but destiny is, is your perception of what happened to you and how you respond to it. Like, you know, you'll hear a lot of people going, well, you know, my girlfriend cheated on me. You know, I got screwed. And I go, well, you picked her. <laughs> You're responsible. <laughs> so if you can turn that around and then you say, hey, I'm responsible for the decision, then your response to it, it's much easier to get through life. But if you're looking for somebody else to blame, uh, so the best piece of human advice would be realizing that you are a hundred percent responsible for everything that happens to you. And that's hard sometimes because someone says, well, I got sick. Well, you're not responsible for that, but then your response to that. And so that's the destiny side of it. You know, fate is kind of laid out and you have accidents and you have these things are going to happen, but you're responsible for your response to them as well. I love that. All right. What's the, uh, what's the best place for people to learn more about you and your work? Uh, we're, uh, on Instagram under Sirens and Titans, uh, you can look us up there. Uh, Facebook, Sirens and Titans Fitness, uh, and then uh, uh, that's the best place to find us. Uh, either one of those, you just Google Sirens and Titans Fitness Los Angeles, you'll find us, and then uh, on social media. And then you can email me directly at I don't know if you're going to put all this in the show notes, but Jay Devore at uh, Sirens and Titans Fitness dot com. Awesome. We'll do that. We'll add all that to the show notes. Jacques, it's been a blast having you on the podcast. Thank you so much for your time. Thanks for having me. I really enjoyed it.
your best. Losers always whine about their best. <laughs>